Uh, good evening. Uh, on behalf of the Yale Graduate Writing Center, I have a great pleasure to welcome you with such a great number today at the Luce Hall. Uh, in business in academia, it all starts with an idea. Our speaker today had many. While he was studying at Harvard University, he co-founded the Harvard Connection, today known as the Facebook. Post-graduation, he took a break from the startup life and spent a few years in New York and Boston working for the hedge fund. But then he went back to grad school to get dual degrees, JD and MBA from Northwestern University and Kellogg School of Management. Divya Narendra founded Sum Zero in 2008 with the intent to change the way the investment industry behaved. What was needed was a platform where funds could collaborate openly for the first time in a secure, transparent environment. Welcome, Divya Narendra. Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me, having me out here in New Haven. Um, it's actually my first visit to uh, to Yale. I, I went to a football game, uh, a couple, like probably like five years ago, but never saw the actual campus. This is my first time being in an actual Yale building, which is kind of nice. Um, so I guess um, y'all wanted to hear about how to write a business proposal. Um, quick background: me, uh, so I'm a local New Yorker. Uh, I was an applied mathematics uh, major. I majored in applied math as an undergrad at Harvard. Um, graduated in 2004. And, um, you know, I think I, at the time, I, I sort of, you know, wasn't really sure where I wanted to, to go post-college. And um, I guess you guys probably experienced this, too, being at a school like Yale, where everyone seems to go into finance or consulting. Um, so I always felt like that was, you know, in, in a way, like a, a backup plan of sorts. Um, and I was lucky enough to come up with uh, the, the concept that you know, now you guys refer to as Facebook, but at the time it was called Harvard Connection. And I realized that you know, I really enjoyed entrepreneurship and I really enjoyed the creative process that, um, you, know, that, that you need to undergo to, to really build a business. Um, and I think you know, step one is, is that, uh, you know, that spark and that, um, you know, that, that moment where you come up with something that you think is really cool and interesting. And, you know, might have some sort of business value uh, over time. Um, so I don't want this to sound or, or come across as too academic. It's, it's not meant to be. I think a lot of the things I'm going to say are hopefully somewhat obvious, and, and uh, if not obvious, uh, uh, hopefully they make sense. Um, but I would say that the, the first thing to, um, to think about if you're thinking about entrepreneurship or thinking about starting a business is just keeping your eyes and your ears open as much as possible to the world around you. Um, and and what, what, what you'll find is that you'll see inefficiencies and problems and all sorts of you know, issues with the way you, know, you run your life. I mean, they might, be, uh, they might have something to do with how you consume music or how you consume information or how you travel from point A to point B. But I think one of the differences between you know, the, the serial entrepreneur and maybe somebody who, who doesn't follow you know, that, that sort of entrepreneurial spirit is that people who are entrepreneurs tend to see problems as opportunities as opposed to, uh, you know, as opposed to simply annoyances in their day. And, um, you know, for me, when I was in college, there was no way to connect with other students that efficiently. I mean, I guess you could, you have your classes and you've got lectures and things of that nature, and you obviously get to know people very well by doing homework sets and problem sets and going out to bars and formals and all the other things that happened in college. But um, you know, it was pretty obvious at the time that, that, that there was probably a better way to at least break the ice with people if you had some centralized online way to, to, you know, to learn more about those around you. Um, similarly, with Sum Zero, my current business, uh, you know, I was working at a fund. And I noticed that, at least at my job, the people I wanted to get hold of the most were my fellow peers working at other funds so I could better understand uh, you know, companies that I was researching. So for example, if you, you might, some of you guys might end up working at hedge funds one day, um, or mutual funds, or other types of investment firms. And you're going to want to understand markets better. You're going to want to understand companies better. And part of that involves doing your own diligence, which is you, know, you might go read um, you know, a 10K or a 10Q, or you might go to like, the SEC website and start reading more information about companies. You might go to the company website itself. But you might also want to talk to a friend who was maybe your year 
or you're older than you who works at another fund who's done a ton of primary research. And before some zero, there was no efficient way to find that person. Um, especially if, you know, for example, maybe you're looking at something that is international or maybe your friends don't cover it. And, and so how do you find that person? Um, so isolating kind of problems is, is I think, step one. Um, step two is understanding the value of, of, you know, what a solution could be. I mean, I think there are lots of things, um, you know, that, that might strike you as annoying or, or might, you know, be problematic, but don't necessarily result in a very valuable business idea. Um, so I think one thing that, um, you know, I try to think about is just understanding the market and understanding the size of the opportunity as being a very basic step in evaluating whether you want to pursue it as an actual business. Um, so, so what does it mean to evaluate the size of a market? So ideally, ideally there's some kind of, um, there's some sort of numerical ballpark that you can arrive to where you're like, wow, this is really exciting. So, you know, I can imagine the guy who invented, you know, the car or, uh, you know, this is, this is going to sound crazy, but if you happen to be, you know, uh, an engineer working in, you know, you're getting your PhD at, uh, at Yale in physics or engineering and you create the next space elevator, like, that's awesome because that's a huge, you know, that would be amazing if we could all travel to space and we could, you know, be Willy Wonka and do crazy things like that. Like, that's something that has enormous business value. Obviously, no one's created such an elevator, but just as an example, um, there's probably a huge market for something as crazy as that. Um, it turns out there was a huge market for search, right? You've got companies like Google, um, Bing, Yahoo that attack that market. And the reason they attack that market is because it's a huge market. It's a multi, multi billion dollar market. Um, there are obviously a lot of entrepreneurs who don't attack big markets, and that's okay. But the advantage of, of targeting a market that's very large is that it leaves a lot of room for error. So one of the things that I think um, you know, uh, you'll notice amongst most entrepreneurs that they tend to screw up a lot, or they tend to they try a lot of things, and a lot of those things don't work, and then eventually they find solutions that do work. And some of those solutions end up in, in, you know, in real businesses. But if you're at least playing in a space where there's a lot of room for growth, or there's a huge customer base, and you know that there's a willingness to pay for a product, and that willingness to pay is large, and you've got a lot of customers willing to pay a certain price for a product or service, at least that gives you kind of this margin of error where, you know, when you think about all the things that go wrong when you're starting a business, you know, that, that includes, you know, being able to raise capital, that includes, you know, risks around the team that you set up, you know, product efficiencies, like all these sorts of issues that come up become, you know, easier to deal with if your end goal is something really, really big. So this is like a pretty obvious point, but I think it's something to consider. And you'll find that when you talk to investors, um, most investors, so this includes venture capitalists, this includes, you know, family offices, high net worth individuals, angels, one of the basic things they're looking for is just a better understanding of if you get everything right, like what is the size of that market? So I think that's kind of something to, uh, uh, to think really hard about. I've got my notes here on this page of the things I wanted to talk about. So that was one, understanding the market. Um, the, uh, one of the other things to obviously think about is, um, you know, whatever your service or whatever your product is, just having a good sense as to the customer, right? What are the pain points of the customer? Um, super, super important. Um, so with Sum Zero, let me just backtrack a little bit just to describe Sum Zero a little bit. Uh, so I started Sum Zero in 2008. And I was in 2007, I was working at a hedge fund that managed money for Harvard's endowment. And the fund actually shut down. Uh, but what got me initially excited about the Sum Zero concept was that the value of good research in the investment industry is huge because, um, you know, if you think about how a fund operates, they charge fees on the returns of the fund. So a typical fund will charge a performance fee of maybe 20%. So if, if the analyst or portfolio manager makes an investment and he's correct, meaning he had an idea and he was right about his analysis, and let's say he allocates, you know, he, he puts on a, a trade, maybe that trade is, you know, a couple million dollars, and, and, and in the case of many funds, it might be significantly larger than that. Um, the returns on that one idea are so high, or you know, generate such high raw dollar value that, you know, if 
if, 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 if I can come to that portfolio manager and give him a really good investment idea and he makes money off of it, um, like that's great for me too, and he'd be willing to pay a lot of money to get access to that idea, right? So what I was thinking was, well, if you can, you know, if the value of one good idea is really, really big, if you can aggregate tens of thousands of those into one platform, that's gotta be worth something. Um, and it's worth a lot to our target audience because our target consumer um, are funds, and they have enormous budgets for uh, value-added data. So just as an, this is a data point, but I'm sure many of you have seen Bloomberg terminals in your, uh, at some point, maybe uh, at least in a photograph. It's really clunky devices with, with like screwy key, keyboards and, you know, the way Bloomberg works is that there's a set of codes that you have, to, you have to know to be able to access various types of data, which includes pricing data and research and other kinds of data. Um, a Bloomberg terminal is about $2,000 a month per terminal. So you have, you know, you have mutual funds that might have 100 analysts where each of them has a Bloomberg terminal and each of them is paying $2,000 a month uh, just for access to that terminal. Um, and, and, and this really, I mean, an individual, like somebody like me, like I would not pay as like a single person, you know, $24,000 or $20,000 a year for access to Bloomberg, but if I'm working at a fund where my entire job revolves around, you know, amassing information and making sure that I have, you know, as much useful information as possible to make an investment decision that could earn my fund, you know, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, like I'm gonna pay that fee uh, for access to that terminal. And so, at least in our industry, or in, in, in the industry that SumZero plays in, that willingness to pay is quite large, and most of, the, most of our target customers have budgets in place uh, for things like SumZero. So we don't have to, you know, necessarily, you know, go to them and say, you need to allocate more money for research. All we have to make, we just have to be able to make the argument that you should shift, you know, what you currently spend for other services to us but at least there's that budget in place for what we're trying to sell. Um, so having a rich set of customers is, is definitely a good thing, and if you have a lot of them, that's even better. Um, so this all sort of, again, ties to understanding the size of your market opportunity. Different businesses obviously have kind of, um, you know, some, some businesses have kind of like a high volume, low margin approach, or, or a, high, a high volume, low price, low average price approach to um, their businesses, other businesses like ours, we're much more niche oriented and we're trying to sell a much higher price point though we probably won't have the same volume that you know, a consumer facing website would have. But when you multiply price by total customer base um, by some conservative penetration rate, you should be excited. Like you should look at that and be like, oh, this is, this is a market that I wanna play in. Um, so, Another thing that I wanted to talk about uh, that's super, super critical is, is just the general notion of differentiation. Um, now, many of you probably could, if you wanted to, buy, like, uh, I don't know, uh, a Subway, you know, store or, you know, become a franchisee or start a local kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know a local, like, retailer or something that's small that, you know, where the business is fairly understood and, but, but whatever you do, whether it's something really small or something really big, I would like, highly recommend that whatever you do is as differentiated as possible. And um, there, there are significant consequences to that. One, if you have a business idea that's unique, uh, one, it becomes easier to market, right? So when you're explaining your concept to somebody, if it turns out that there's nobody else offering that product or service, um, you know, at least you're you know, you're, you're in a way protected somewhat from existing competition because nobody actually is, is selling that same product or service. So with SumZero, like, we're trying to create a new database, right? This is a database of buy-side research. Historically, hedge fund analysts never published their research. So we're trying to get them to do that. Um, and part of why this helps us when we market our data is that that data doesn't exist anywhere else. In fact, you couldn't go to Bloomberg, you couldn't go to Thomson Reuters, you couldn't go to... Uh, you know, S&P or CapIQ or FactSet and get the same data that we have on our platform. Um, and and what, that, what that also does is it helps you avoid all kinds of price wars and just downward pricing in general, right? The worst thing is when you're trying to sell a completely undifferentiated product um, and, the, you know, where your only way to compete is price. 
So for those of you in business school, like you study this a lot, and it, you know, it's, it's, it's again, fairly obvious, but um, there's, there's, there's nothing wor worse than being in a price war with a competitor that, you know, where you have no real competitive advantage. Um, so it also helps in terms of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the vendors and suppliers that you deal with in terms of, you know, if, you're, if you've got a product that, um, uh, you know, is unique and, and is sort of high value, when you're negotiating with distributors, or you're negotiating with suppliers, it's usually a higher chance that you're going to be able to negotiate kind of more favorably for yourself if you're selling something that's, 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 that's somewhat unique. Um, so that's not to say that, you know, if you, uh, you know, if you're selling Levi's jeans that you couldn't make money. It's just that, you know, you got to believe that over the long run, if you're making a lot of money doing that, other businesses, other entrants will come in and try to do the same thing. And it becomes hard to defend yourself against that kind of competition. So, you know, how do you determine like what's unique, what isn't? That's a very like long research process. Understanding the competitive landscape is hugely, hugely important. So whatever your industry is, whether it's fashion or, or healthcare or, you know, in my case, investment research, knowing what every single competitor sells, how they price that product, what the characteristics are of that product, is just upfront research that you should do. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not something that you have to write down on a piece of paper in the, you know, in, in the formal business proposal sense, but um, understanding your competition is just like, it's everything. I mean, if you don't have that, um, it's, 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 it'll be hard for you to, to defend, you know, or to compel yourself to want to start a new business. So that's, that's, that's really important. Um, the other thing that um, at least I think about, and I don't know how much this, if this is sort of industry practice or not, is kind of the question like, why, why now? So when you, when you, if you have a new idea, so one of the risks to, to, have, to being too creative or too original is that maybe customers aren't ready for like whatever it is you're bringing to the table. Um, and you know, we kind of face this problem at some zero, uh, though I think we're starting to overcome it. Um, but you know, is the market ready for the product that you're trying to sell? Um, so I don't know if I was to uh, create like you know shoes with some sort of booster pack on it that allowed me to like run faster. Like I don't know if there's actually a market for that. You know, like maybe that's like beyond you know the, the you know what people currently want for uh, you know when they buy shoes or sneakers. Um, but really understanding kind of the trends is important. So one of the th this is an interesting data point as well. So one of the reasons why I think like, Facebook did well when it launched, um, and this was you know circa 2004, call it. February or March 2004, whatever it was, um, was that at that time, uh, cell phones um, were starting to have cameras built into the phone. And people would take photos of each other using their cell phones. I mean, today it's obviously common practice. But that sort of feature dates back to about the same time that social networking as an industry started to take off. And um, you know, if you think about what, what networks today um, are, are, you know, if you look at the largest networks, I mean, they're basically Facebook and, and, and Instagram. I mean, these, they, they, you know, a huge chunk of the data that's being aggregated are actually photos. Nowadays, it's beyond that. Now, now you've got video as well. But, um, you know, I kind of wonder what, you know, whether this, we would have seen the same growth um, with the use of, of Facebook if, if smartphones and if, if uh, you know, at least camera-enabled phones didn't exist back then. Um, that was a trend that was starting to take off. Um, I think in, in my industry, like in general, like we're seeing more and more of a trend towards transparency. So it used to be the case that the hedge fund industry was extremely secretive. And, and some of you might wonder, like, why do people share ideas in my industry? We can talk about that at some point. But, um, but, but you know, some of this is kind of governed by just, you know, the SEC and regulatory agencies. But there's more and more transparency in our industry. And so... That makes it easier for me as like you know the business owner of a website that's promoting, you know the sharing of information because, uh, you know, that old school way of thinking is kind of changing that you shouldn't share any of your ideas. Um, so anyway, that 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 sort of why now question is 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 an interesting one to ponder as you're thinking about like your your business idea. Um, you know sometimes entrepreneurs come too early or they're they're late to the game. Ideally, you want to be at that inflection point or right before it, where you you know you, your product is really positioned to take advantage of some sort of market trend. 
Um, okay, team. This is like another really important uh, discussion. Um, sort of how to select partners. Usually, you don't find uh, companies take off that only have one, you know, sole founder. Usually, like the initial team is two or three people. I mean, oftentimes I'd say it's probably probably two people, but you know, sometimes you see bigger bigger founding teams. Um, you know, one of the things I struggled with when I was an undergrad was just I, because I wasn't a developer, finding somebody who was a developer was 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 hard because a lot of them speak a totally different language, they have a different skill set, um, and uh, you know, I mean, you, you you have to in a way convince other people to want to work with you. So how do you do that? So one, I think it's really important that you build teams where people have complementary skill sets. So you don't want to have you know, three guys or three, you know, three women on a team or whatever the combination is where they all do the same thing because that's not going to really um, be the most efficient way to build your business. Um, uh, and then part of it is also just sort of selling. So let's say you're the one with a great idea and you know, you know that you lack technical skills. Um, one of the things that I think is like pretty, I don't know if there's something that's, that's taught or what, but um, that's sort of the skill set that involves getting people just to sign the dotted line, so to speak is something that you have to become comfortable with. And they don't really teach the art of selling in school, but that's something that I think is probably a trait that you'll find in most entrepreneurs, that, that, that they tend to be good salespeople. And whether that's selling a you know, physical product or a SKU, or whether it's, it's, it's simply building a team, that team building is a huge part of what founders do. Um, and, and, and my goal is, like, I'd love to be running a business one day where I don't even have to come to work because I've got all the right guys who are there um, you know, doing what they need to do to build a business. Um, and so recruiting is, is, is a huge, huge hurdle. Um, it's, it's probably the, the number one hurdle for most startup entrepreneurs is you know, how do you find the right people? How do you find the right person to help with marketing? How do you find the right technical guy? How do you find the right co-founder? Um, you know, so part of it's just you being analytical about what kind of team you want, and part of it is is kind of the selling. And then from a compensation standpoint, um, you want to make sure that everyone you work with is, is motivated to do a great job. So you know, uh, at the beginning when you have no money and you're just kind of scraping by, the only way to do that is through, I mean, typically by giving them some ownership in the business. And m my one sort of piece of advice there is, you know, you don't want to be too greedy. You want to, it's much better to own you know, a small piece of a big pie than a big piece of nothing. Uh, which is, again, like, kind of goes without saying, but you always see people getting into arguments where, you know, like, the two founders are, are, are at loggerheads because of their equity split or their, their allocation, that they're not happy with how they're being, you know, what portion of the business they own. But in reality, in the long run, what's best for the business is, is going to be what's best for any individual shareholder in that business. And being, you know, sort of thoughtful about how you structure the ownership of your business is, is very, very important. And it's so important, in fact, that when you try and raise capital, if you try and raise capital, what you'll, what, one of the questions that any VC will ask you is, you know, what's your cap table look like? Who are the owners in your business? How much do they each own? And what are they doing for that business? Um, and if there's a situation where there's some guy who's got a big chunk of equity in your business, but they're not actively involved, that will most likely, um, you know, either enrage the investor, and, and they'll probably force you to have a, you know, a talk with that guy to renegotiate your split, um, or it'll, it'll, it'll just kill the deal entirely. So that's, that's something to, to just think about. Um, okay, advisors. I've, uh, you know, um, a lot of startups have advisors, uh, or they set up some sort of board of advisors. I personally never had a formal set of advisors. I feel like most of my Advisors have been somewhat informal. Um, I don't think there's a right answer on that front. I think for those of you who, uh, you know, like want kind of a formal board, that's fine. Um, I think the the most important thing, though, with respect to advice, is just seek as much of it as possible. So, you know, a lot of people, and I mean, this goes beyond just entrepreneurs. But people tend to be insecure about a lot of things. One of them, you know, one of those things might be their business ideas. So don't be insecure. Go and get feedback. Talk to as many folks as possible. If you have um, you know, a concrete sense of what your product or service is, go ahead and talk to a potential customer. Talk to 20 of them. 
uh, and see whether they would find that product or service useful. Um, those are the sorts of channel checks that any investor would do if they were thinking about putting money into your business, but it's the sort of thing you want to do yourself ahead of time. So before you, you know, um, put too much time and capital into an idea, uh, you know, try and establish what the real demand for that product or service is, and be totally honest with yourself. You know, I think um, just being uh, like having that sense of humility about what you're trying to achieve and and what the real status is of, of your product is, is really important because if you don't know what's wrong with your product, or you don't know what's wrong with your service, you're not gonna be, you're not gonna be moving in the right direction, you're not gonna be solving those problems. And the best way to get that is through you know, customer feedback. Um, so anyway, um, okay, as far as uh, the business plan goes itself, um, there's nothing original here, but, but the parts of it are very straightforward. I mean, you want to have sort of a, a statement of what the problem is that you're trying to solve. You want, you know, kind of your solution. We talked about market sizing. That's, that's a very, like, important initial uh, component to have in your, in your, in your, in your formal, formal business plan. Um, as far as um, the, uh, you know, the financials go and all that sort of stuff, you know, most investors in early stage businesses like realize that, um, you know, when they look at a when they look at an income statement or a cash flow statement from an entrepreneur who's, you know, just starting out, most of it is kind of hocus pocus, right? It's kind of a hand waving exercise, um, but it is important just from like a, a discipline standpoint to just on paper write down kind of what you think, what are the levers that are going to drive revenues, or you know, what are the major costs and how are they going to you know, um, at least what are the, the big ones, the big drivers of costs, so they can understand kind of what the unit economics are of what, of what you're trying to sell. Um, some investors, depending on what stage you get, will want a more detailed operating model that'll go, you know, into, you know, just more detail on the individual expense items. Um, if there's multiple revenue streams, you'll want to kind of attack each one of them uh, in a more detailed fashion. Um, and, uh, and then also, I think one of the things that people don't, I think when, when people are coming up with ideas, they don't really think too much about is how do they plan on marketing their business? Um, you know, today we live in a day, I think where in our age, people are used to reading stories about companies like Instagram that you know, were yesterday were nothing and today they're you know, billion dollar businesses. There's a huge amount of just selection bias when you read a newspaper about a company that's done well. For every one of those companies, they're just, I mean, there are like a thousand that have failed miserably um, and don't have that like viral growth pattern. So um, having a good sense as to how you plan on, you know, if it's a social network, how do you plan on building that network? Who are your first, you know, thousand users going to be and why are they going to join? Um, you know, in my case, it's kind of interesting, like with SumZero, one of the rules that we have on SumZero is that if you want access to the research on SumZero, you have to contribute research of your own. And that gets you access for six months. So we leverage this philosophy of reciprocity. It sounds a little bit like sharing is caring, but it's, it's a very simple quid pro quo. Um, but the problem was, in the beginning, you know, in 08, when I launched the service, um, there, were no, there were no analysts, there were no ideas, there was no research. So there was, you know, people would be posting stuff just because I told them to, because they were my friends, you know? Um, but that's not, I mean, it can work like that, you know, but if you have this chicken and egg problem where you're not sure how you're going to jumpstart your idea, um, you just have to think about that. Like, what, what is actually going to get you your first 10 customers, or your first, you know, 100 customers, whatever it ends up being. Um, and so there are tons of ways to do that. I mean, there's, there's kind of the direct sales method. There's, there's, you know, digital advertising. I mean, now there's a ton of stuff you can, you can do um, using kind of social media channels. Um, but that's something to really think about. And, and as you're marketing your product, this is where you leverage all of that, um, that research that you've done in terms of how your product is differentiated um, and how it stands, up, stands apart from everything else in the competitive landscape. So that's another pretty important thing to, uh, to, uh, to think about. Um, as far as um, costs go, um, at the beginning, I would say it's... You know, you're, you're forced to be as lean as possible. Um, so you know, everyone's always in a, everyone's in a different situation when they start. I mean, some people have some savings that they can put into their business. So when I was um, so after college, I worked at Credit Suisse for two years, and then I worked at a hedge fund. 
after that, after my hedge fund you know careers sort of ended, I just dumped all of my savings into Sum Zero, which looking back might have been a little bit, you know, somewhat insane, but there are many examples of entrepreneurs who are just levered to the gills with credit card debt when they're starting out. I don't recommend that, um, but but uh, it, it, I think when you're trying to uh, start a business, some people, they try to raise outside capital too early before they've really invested their own money into their idea. And I think it looks really good when you go to an outside investor and you say, you know what, I put 50 grand or whatever, you know, I put 10 grand into this idea and a ton of time and here's how far I've taken it. And over that time period, you'll learn about your business better, you'll build a better roadmap, and you'll just make a more convincing case than you would if you went to an investor with you know, a paper napkin idea, having done no research and having put none of your own money into your idea. You're much I think you're gonna be less likely to pull off um, a cap raise if you don't have that sweat equity and also financial equity put into your own business. Um, of course, this, you, know, you will read stories about people who raise money without that. Um, but in terms of, you know, uh, what valuation you, you receive, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, just, just the sort of terms that you'll get once you've put a significant amount of work yourself into an idea, um, those will all improve significantly versus, you know, some people who, yeah, who just come up with an idea and they try to go raise money right away. Um, venture capital and angel capital is by far the most expensive capital you'll ever raise, assuming your business does well. Um, you know, that's when your company is the most fragile. Uh, you generally don't have a team. You generally have all kinds of needs. You probably don't even have an office. Um, and so, in terms of leverage, you have the least leverage on anyone you talk to, whether it's an angel investor or, or a more institutionalized VC or something in between, or even your friends and family. I mean, a lot of people, like, their first step is calling their parents. That's fine, um, but, but even then, there's, it's, it's hard to convince your parents to write you a check um, if you haven't put a sufficient amount of work into, into uh, your concept. Um, so, okay, I also wanted to talk about um, social media specifically. Um, typically, I mean, from what I see, and maybe this is changing a little bit, but Social media today has obviously become a huge industry and a lot of people get excited about it. Um, and so, you know, how do you, how do you find the right idea in social media itself? Clearly, you have Facebook on one end, which is kind of the large, you know, um, you know as far as kind of uh, universal networks go, it's very, very, very difficult to compete with Facebook. Um, it's much more likely that you're gonna, if, you've, if you do wanna build some kind of social media website, that it has some niche application that's not served by LinkedIn or Facebook or Tumblr or, you know, or Instagram or any of these other networks or Twitter. Um, and uh, what, what, I've, what I think is, is, is helpful is to think about kind of how a specific niche operates in the real world and to see if that can be, you know, if that, if that behavior can be replicated online um, and so, um, you know, some zero again, great example. Analysts tend to talk to themselves all the time, right? But at least in, in, the, in the world of finance, like social media is, is kind of a new thing. It's not, you know, um, people are still used to using Bloomberg. And if you look at Bloomberg's interface, it's, it's very challenging to learn. It it's actually almost has like a DOS look, if you guys remember DOS, which predated Windows. I mean, that's in a way, it's super, it's very far behind. Um, and so, you know, given that, at least in the professional investment world, people like sharing ideas because it helps them make money, it, to me, it made a lot of sense to like, okay, let's connect this like very, very specific niche of very high value folks. And, and, and what's nice about our particular community is that we can gamify the entire Sum Zero community because they're writing about things that trade in the markets. So when somebody posts a piece of research on Sum Zero, we can actually track like what the price was of that security when that analyst recommended it and how that's changed over time. We can also enable our members to, to rate each other's ideas, which is more of a predictive rating system. Than, it's more forward-looking than, than backward-looking. Um, and, and, and overall, we can make it an incredibly competitive place to interact, which is good for us because it incentivizes not just you know, um, any sort of contribution, but high quality contributions because 
what we want to do is tap into the egos of our members and enable them to use some zero as a brand building and reputation building platform. So um, I don't know if that makes sense, but you know, there, we're not looking for massive amounts of traffic and huge eyeballs. That, you know, what we really care about is the quality of the content that's and the quality of the engagement, the quality of the conversation that people have on our website, and that's why transparency and this like very gamified environment is good for us. Um, and I think you know if you can incorporate some kind of gamification into uh, you know if you're starting a social media website uh, where you want people to engage with one another, where their reputations are on the line and they really have an incentive to not just you know type a bunch of gibberish into you know a chat window, but really say um, you know really submit some kind of credible and vetted content. Um, you have to make that environment a fairly competitive one. Um, so gamification is key, and, and I think really getting into people's heads is, is, is as, as creepy as that sounds, um, is pretty important. Because uh, you want to you know, set the, um, the rules uh, in such a way that everyone's incentivized to kind of to do what's good for the community. So have you guys heard of like Quora? So Quora is an example of a site that tries to do this as well. I'm going to say like some zero in a sense is kind of a core on steroids, but very much um, narrowly focused on, on investment research. But they try to do the same thing, right? Like they're trying to, they're not trying to just amass any kind of data. They want, they want data that's actually valuable, that people can read and be like, okay, this was useful. Um, there are lots of sites out there that have huge amounts of data, most of which is total noise. Um, I mean, I, if you, it's kind of funny. You guys should log into Yahoo Finance. There's a message board section on Yahoo Finance where you, if you do a search for a stock, let's say you search for Google, you can see what people are saying about Google. The chain of comments are like just completely pointless. I mean, it's just like it's just it's more entertainment than it is like real like content that you can use for any sort of investment decision. Um, so anyway, I think gamification is kind of important. Um, I was going to say like lunch time. How long have I been talking? I'm like, oh, sorry. That was way longer than I was supposed to talk. Um, so anyway, happy to answer questions. I think Q&A is much more useful than me just blabbering. Um, but uh, fire away. Uh, <laughs> um, this is a really late debate, but how realistic is the social network for this? Oh, yeah. A, uh, you're right. Unrelated question. Um, well, the material, fa like the, 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 the big point, the, the material facts of, of the movie are accurate. Um, there's just a lot of dramatization. So, um, like, personality wise, like, none of us were interviewed before the movie. So, you know, I don't think the director or the, um, you know, Aaron Sorkin who wrote the script had a great sense of what we were like on a personal level. Um, but I, I thought the movie did a good job of not overstepping its bounds. So, there were certain things that, you know, they didn't know because they wrote the script in, I want to say, 2009, maybe. Uh, and at that point, the actual, the, the, the events, you know, the litigation process hadn't, it hadn't uh, ended. So um, I think they had their lawyers take a very close look at, at the script to avoid getting sued. And, you know, but overall, I think you walk out from that movie thinking, you know, sort of, one, I th it was entertaining. So, I mean, at least I thought it was entertaining. Um, but, but, but two, you know, you, like, because I've asked some folks, like, so, you know, whose idea do you, do you think it really was? And they'll be like, oh, not really sure, you know. So they, they don't make any, like, um, they did a good job of just staying within what they've, what was in the public domain. So they used depositions, they used, uh, yeah, I guess there were, there were um, you know, certain articles that might have, um, from the Crimson, like, things like that, that were in the public domain uh, without assuming too much about what had actually happened. But it is Hollywood, so keep that in mind. Um, I was played by a guy who's like yay tall, <laughs> and uh, doesn't look anything like me. But uh. going back to the business proposal topic, um, recently there was an article in the Wall Street Journal um, saying that business proposals are actually going obsolete, and now uh, investors don't need them. Even if yeah. they look at them, they change with time, so nobody really is going to need them in the future. 
Right. Um, what's your take on that? So I've actually never written a business proposal myself. Um, I should have started out with that. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but it's something you have to have in your mind, right? It's not like, like writing down a business plan is, you do that for yourself mostly, right? Um, but if you have a concrete sense of what you want to do in your head, you don't, it, you know, it's just, it's just a formality to write it down. But the other stuff that goes into it is important, right? Because you're right, it changes, like all these things change. But I think if you want to maximize your chance of getting it right, if you're not doing your research on who are the other players in the market, you know, if you don't understand how similar products are priced, if you don't, if you don't have that in your head, it's like you're not, you're, it's almost random like where you start, right? Um, I think what happens is like, you have to convince yourself that okay, if I you know, go down path A and then it doesn't work, like, then, you, then you can pivot and do something else, but it, you don't want to be going down like a, 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 like a path that where you can't leverage any of the stuff you've done on that path for your pivot, right? So what, the stories that you read about you know, businesses changing their models, so Groupon did this, right, where they used to be kind of, they had like a nonprofit bent. But they were able, even though they switched gears, they were able to use what they had, they had done to make that change a smoother change. Um, but, but yeah, the formalities of a business plan. Like what they teach you, some of you guys are MBAs, I take it. Um, like I have an MBA, I never actually took an entrepreneurship class. Um, but what they teach you there is kind of like the actual formalities. But the more important thing is like what goes, you know, what are the big components of the business plan? And you have to have, um, you have to have some conviction behind what path you follow. Because when you go raise money, um, you don't want to sound like you're hesitating. You don't want to sound like you're confused about your own business. Like you want to you have that confidence when you go talk to an investor that this is how this business is going to grow and you know, this is how we're going to crush it. You know, that, that's kind of the attitude that you want. Um, you don't want to come across as confused. So, or, oh. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> we'll get them both. So my question to you is like, um, uh, basically uh, the proposals uh, can be bifurcated into the ones which is like the new economy ones and the old economy ones. I mean like uh, you would have, I mean like for Facebook when it actually happened, there was no competition as such. So you are saying to have a research. I feel that things which were like, which are still coming up or which would be replaced in future and whosoever takes it and write a uh, uh, good uh, business proposal, he would be always standing apart. How about when you're talking in terms of things which are uh, already there in the market and you're trying to make a niche or you want to just extend uh, the already, uh, uh, you know, already, uh, you're trying to have a business plan for already existing uh, this thing? Uh, well, I, I would say that even if you're idea is not necessarily that original or new, you still have to have something that differentiates what you're doing from someone else. Because, I mean, y you could, I mean, look, like, you could do something that's been done many times before and, and just replicate it, but try and target a new market, right? Or try and, try and, you know, you have to have something that's, you know, maybe you have access to a distribution channel that the existing players don't have access to. Or maybe there's a slight tweak that you're making that makes it better. I mean, I would say that all industries today, just given the nature of technology, are affected by technology, right? Like, like whether it's an old retail business or, you know, uh, you know, something in biotech, which is like, you know, all about tech or technology and high technology, y you should have something in there where you're leveraging what's new and innovative to make your business better. Because if, because what's the point of starting something that's been done before with no no, I mean, I meant was like, uh, how would you differentiate the business proposal for the new ones and the old ones? Oh, there's no difference. There's nothing, I mean, uh, the whole purpose of a business proposal is to show how your business is going to make money, right? So the, the revenue model, the costs, understanding the unit costs at, at scale, like that, that's really, right, that, that's the whole purpose of a business proposal. But th that's not unique to new businesses or, or, or uh, new versus old, right? Every business is trying to make money. I mean. Um, it's pretty, yeah. Like, what, what changes are the products and services themselves? But I think if you look at how 
businesses are analyzed, if you look at how businesses are valued, that hasn't changed at all. I mean, like Warren, Warren Buffett will make money like the same way he's made money before because he has a framework in which he values companies, right? But, and if you go to any, if you take any finance class, um, the actual valuation methodologies are the same methodologies that have been in existence since, yeah, I don't even know how long, right? So that stuff doesn't change. Like you're always gonna do a DCF, right, if you wanna value a stock. Or you're gonna look at comparable, you're gonna look at earnings multiples of other competitors. You're gonna look at sales multiples of your competitors. Like all that stuff is the same. But, sorry. Oh, I actually had two questions, but you just answered one of mine. So my second question has to do with uh, staking the company. Okay. With your founders. Now, do you have some kind of a number where the founders of a company should hold certain, uh, certain percentage of the stake within the company while leaving some other portion for uh, raising capital? So um, uh, this is just from like my own mistakes, but you want to, typically you want to have some sort of vesting schedule. And all that means is that so you and your co-founder can agree that you're going to own a certain piece of this pie, right? And uh, maybe it's half and half. But if your co-founder leaves after a year, like you don't want 50% of the company's stock being owned by some guy who doesn't even work for the business anymore, right? So how do you, how do you, how do you uh, deal with that scenario? Well, at the outset, you agree to put your, both of yourselves on some kind of vesting schedule where you earn your equity. You're not just giving it off the bat. Um, so you earn it over time. Usually in venture, it's a four-year period. Uh, and for employees, oftentimes it's four-year period with a one-year cliff where for that first year, if you leave, you don't get any equity. And that's just normal. Um, but that's how you avoid these situations where you have just dead equity. I mean, ideally you wanna have a cap structure where there's no slack and everyone who has um, any ownership at all is, 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 is adding kind of commensurate value to the business. So for the venture capitalists and the angel investors, once you're trying to raise capital from them, you want to set aside some of the- Well, th at that point, you're, so that's, that's, a, that's a negotiation, right? So what, what the VC will say is, okay, we like your business. We wanna, we wanna, we wanna give you capital. Right, and then they take a stake in your business. Typically, venture firms will take 20% of your business. Right, um, that means that your 50% goes down to 40%. So you give up 10, your partner gives up 10, and that 10, that 20 goes to the VC. Um, these are all like just hypothetical numbers, but um, that's typically how it works. And so, the actual dilution that you take on is is negotiated deal by deal. Right. Um, and, and the higher the valuation is, the less dilution you'll take for any set amount of capital that's being contributed to the firm. Uh, good evening. Hi. Um, I was curious, so we're talking about how even the most well thought out business proposal at the beginning um, is probably gonna undergo some changes and tweaks yeah. and all that. Um, so I was just curious, I guess it's kind of about like the politics of raising capital and going around and, and raising funds in that if you've found that your proposal has changed, um, are there like legal obligations to go back and, and talk to people that have already secured, you've secured funding with? Have you ever had issues? I'm just curious. Well, usually there's a board, right? So if, if you raise money, um, one of the terms of raising capital is a board seat, and it might be more than one board seat. Um, but usually an early stage inv investor will want at least one person from his organization on the board. And so, yeah, I mean, I, there's, it goes without saying, like, you should be totally transparent with your investors. In fact, when they invest, many of them, you know, like they will require that you give them financials, that you, you might, they might require that you talk to them on a monthly basis or something like that. Um, so that's not really politics, that's just kind of, um, good business, you know, practice, um, and, and and it's also good to maintain that dialogue because because of the inevitable screw ups. Like if they have at least an understanding of what your problems are, they can try and fix it. I mean, anybody who's doing early stage investing is aware of the fact that they might not see their money ever again, right? It's it's like film financing. Like nobody gives. I mean, <laughs> it's not like totally like film financing, but a lot of investors who write checks to 
directors like never see that money again. Even movies that you probably like, you, you make no money. You know, venture is better than that. Like you know, I think the returns are better in venture, but still, it's most of them understand that there's a lot of risk to early stage investing. But as long as you're upfront with them about it, it's it's going to be, I think, uh, you know, you, you, you won't burn any bridges. The worst thing you can do. I mean, I knew a guy who this guy raised like three million bucks from like ten different firms and burned it all in like 18 months or something. But because each of the firms had a small percentage ownership in, like they, like each of them probably had like 5% or less, none of them had a board seat. So none of them were clued in into what was going wrong with the business. And then $3 million later, it was just like a wipeout. It was a total bagel. And like you can imagine the reaction from all those investors who were like, shit, like I just gave you, you know, a quarter million bucks or half a million dollars and you burned it without letting me know what was going on. So those are situations you, you know, th again, that's not politics, that's just terrible business practices. You know, it's a poor business practices. So. We have time for one more question. Hi. Um, just going back to Sun Zero. Sure. So there are a lot of um, articles relating that when analysts are having doing a recommendation for one asset or for an account, if they have, if they know what other analysts know about it, uh, that account, they will take more risks about um, the recommendation of that account because they can back up their opinion about it. And with some zero, that sounds to me that now they each analyst will have more information about what other analysts are thinking, and they will start taking more risks when analyzing an account and want making a decision and making a, a recommendation? Do you have any thoughts about it? Uh, I mean, I've never read that article. Uh, I mean, the, the whole, the goal behind Sum Zero is to help people make better investment decisions by giving them access to very high quality research and information that comes from a completely vetted community. So, um, you know, the typical contributing member of some zero, they work at funds, right? So their whole job is to do research and, and primary research, but also as a check to, to understand what the markets say about a given name. Uh, we are like one part of their investment process. Uh, but, you know, hopefully, you know, because we do a good job of vetting our membership, um, when they read that piece of research and they validate it, they find it useful. Because um, there, there are a lot of places you can go to for, you know, ideas on what stocks to invest in and what not to invest in. But if you want access to, you know, a, a proper valuation on that name, channel checks, what the risks are, um, just a detailed understanding of the, the markets and all of that, you want to talk to a professional investor because their job is to sit, you know, at a computer all day and, and grind it out, like do that, to do that work. Um, you know, usually if you're like a value-oriented investor, I mean, it would take like a month to get up to speed on a single company. So if people can go on some zero and read that research and at least kind of help themselves get up to speed faster, um, it saves them time and ultimately will hopefully make them, uh, you know, it'll help them make a more informed investment decision. So that's, that's our goal. Um, there is a lot of, I mean, I think people attempt to, uh, you know, can attempt to game the system somewhat, but because everybody is sophisticated, in the community, if there's, let's say somebody posts something that's just clearly uh, not accurate or, or maybe is, is just overly exaggerated or maybe somebody's trying to spread rumors, they subject themselves to the scrutiny of the community so they'll just get a, they'll get a poor rating for that particular idea. So it doesn't make them look good to, uh, you know, perpetrate some sort of fraud or, or, or to just misrepresent themselves um, amongst a community of sophisticated. It's kind of like, you know, in school, like if you're, you know, because you're in an environment where everyone is smart, you know, or at least on paper they're smart, um, you know, if, some, if your teacher tells you, like, hey, I want you to, you know, I don't know, lead a discussion on a particular topic, and you do a terrible job, it, you know, or, or you try to, to sort of, uh, y you know, uh, finagle your way through the discussion, like, because you're in a sophisticated peer group, people like your other peers will know, and it's not going to make you look good. So we try to create this system where people have a strong incentive to post high quality stuff. 
Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. It's fun.